mm, mm, really hooking me. Oh my God, should we be really chaotic? What the F, what's going on? Being like that girl at the airport. Why, 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 why? I don't hate it. I'm in disbelief. No, that doesn't really get me going. Dang it, that is how you write a first freaking paragraph. I don't know what past Sam was even thinking. I'm Sam. There's quite literally no one asking me to do this, but I'm flying to Seattle today and I would like to pick my TBR for my trip with you. I also just showered this morning, so we get to watch my hair frizz together in real time. So I have chosen a tentative list of books on my physical TBR that I would like to take, but I thought it would be kind of fun to read the first paragraph of each book and use that as sort of a litmus test of, am I really excited to read this book? So the first book I'm considering is The Pisces by Melissa Broder. I already kind of know I'm gonna like this because I was actually listening to this on audiobook originally. I DNF'd it temporarily so that I could purchase a physical copy and annotate it. The Pisces is about this woman who goes through a breakup and then she's really struggling floating through life so her sister's like hey come to my home in venice beach we'll pay you to dog sit and house sit and then she becomes entranced by this swimmer who i think ends up actually being a mermaid so i kind of already know i'm gonna really like this one but the first paragraph of this one is one i was no longer lonely but i was I had Dominic, my sister's diabetic foxhound, who followed me from room to room, lumbering onto my lap, unaware of his bulk. I liked the smell of his meaty breath, which he didn't know was rancid. I liked the warmth of his fat belly, the primal way he crouched when he took a shit. It felt so intimate, scooping his gigantic the big hot bags of them. I thought, this is the proper use of my love. This is the man for me. This is the way. So yeah, obviously Melissa Broder, she just writes such freaking hilarious readable stuff. So that's going in the yes pile. Next is Tin Foil Butterfly by Rachel Eve Moulton. So Tin Foil Butterfly is about this woman named Emma who's hitchhiking to the Badlands, trying to outrun her past. And she finds herself abandoned in the Black Hills. She takes shelter in this diner where she finds this little boy named Earl who is in a tin foil mask and kind of like her past and his weird world collide. But the first paragraph is one. I swing my body up to the front seat of the van and put my feet on the dashboard. My Doc Martens are filthy and I wet my forefinger to rub at a particularly offensive patch. It clears a trail that makes the rest of the dust more visible and clods of dirt hit the floor. I roll the window down and release the most offensive chunks into the fresh air. That's not really grabbing me as much as the Melissa Broder one did. So I think I'm gonna put this one in the no pile. Next we have In the House in the Dark of the Woods by Laird Hunt. And this is a colonial America, woods are scary type story. It seems like it's gonna be kind of like feminist too, cause it says a wife goes missing, but may have in fact fled her stifling and abusive home. Women who lack both voice and sovereignty may seek freedom at the price of damnation. So hopefully it's like a bunch of ladies becoming witches. Okay, first paragraph. Chapter one. I told my man I was off to pick berries and that he should watch our son for I would be gone some good while. So away I went with a basket. I walked and picked and ate and took off my shoes. I left them to sit by themselves and tromped my bare feet in the stream. Along I went straight down the watery road, singing and smiling under the sun. The water was fresh and clear and I went farther away from our home than I ever had before. It was nice in the field on the far bank of the stream, so I lay down and warmed my wet legs and tried to think of a song as clear and fresh as the water to sing that evening to my son. There would be sweet fish in my song and young frogs and green fronds to wave the good long length of it. Weakness would not be in my song. There would be no harsh word. My man would sit silently and listen. Hmm. I mean, yeah, that's like sounds good, but it's not really like, mm really hooking me so I think this is also gonna go in the no pile. Next is String Follow by Simon Jacobs. This is kind of a subversive horror book that came out I think a couple years ago and it takes place in Ohio. String Follow is a razor sharp suburban gothic that exposes the sweating bleeding truth of how kids become adults in 21st century America. So yeah I think it's just these teens coming up against a strange force or this entity in their town. It kind of sounds like It by Stephen King a little bit. Okay so this doesn't really have like a super easy paragraph, so I'm just gonna arbitrarily choose here. Picture a living room, a staging area, furniture ringed around its perimeter, a large couch, several upholstered armchairs, a wooden accent chair in the corner, big demonstrative windows on the wall facing the street. A coffee table occupied the center of the room at one point, though it's been removed. There are still faint indentations in the cream-colored carpet where the feet sat for years, and a rectangular patch of the carpet slightly richer in color. The center of the room as a result of its former presence seems eerily empty, anticipatory in its emptiness. Hmm. 
Not gonna lie, that sounds kind of boring. <laughs> That doesn't really get me going. So I'm gonna put this in the no pile too. Okay, next is Bad Man by Dathan Auerbach. And I'm not even gonna read the first line because why would I pick this giant hardcover? Like, I don't know what past Sam was even thinking putting this in the pile. So no, I don't wanna trample with this, no. Next is Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchor. I have been really wanting to read this for a long time. So I have high hopes for this first paragraph. This is about this damned Mexican village, unreliable narrators. There's a witch that's killed and then her murder is investigated. So I am excited by all of those themes. Okay, first paragraph, one. They reached the canal along the track leading up from the river their slingshots drawn for battle and their eyes squinting, almost stitched together in the midday glare. There were five of them, their ringleader the only one in swimming trunks, red shorts that blazed behind the parched crops of the cane fields, still low in early May. The rest of the troop trailed behind him in their underwear, all four scowling and fierce and so ready to give themselves up for the cause that not even the youngest, bringing up the rear, would have dared admit he was scared. The elastic of his slingshot pulled taut in his hands, the rock snug in the leather pad, primed to strike anything that got in his way at the very first sign of an ambush. Be that the call of the Biente Veo, perched unseen like a guard in the trees behind them, the rustle of leaves being thrashed aside, or the whoosh of a rock cleaving the air just beyond their noses, the breeze warm and the almost white sky thick with ethereal birds of prey, and a terrible smell that hit them harder than a fistful of sand in the face, a stench that made them want to hawk it up before it reached their guts, that made them want to stop and turn around. Okay, that was literally the longest freaking sentence. I kept looking for a stopping point because that was a really long first paragraph. That sentence was so long. I'm in disbelief. Oh, I don't know. Did that really sound good? I don't know. It sounded really wordy. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll make a maybe pile. This will be maybe. Okay, next is The Postmortal by Drew McGarry, another one I've been really wanting to read for like months and months. So this is a speculative fiction wherein people can get a cure for their mortality and become immortal. And I think it's gonna be funny. It's gonna be like funny, but also like making some commentary about human mortality. So the first chapter is a note about the text from the Department of Containment, United North American Territories, February 6th, 2093. In March 2090, a worker for the Department of Containment named Anton Viren was conducting a routine sweep of an abandoned collectivist compound in rural Virginia when he stumbled upon an eighth generation wireless enabled projected screening device, WEPS.8, that was still functional after charging. Stored inside the device's hard drive was a digital library containing 60 years worth of text files written by a man who went by the screen name John Farrell. Mmm, that sounds kind of boring too. What the F, what's going on? I think that's going to no. know. Next is Animal by Lisa Tadeo, another one that I had previously started on audiobook and then I liked it so much that I was like, hey, I want to annotate this. I'm going to get a physical copy. So kind of cheating with this one again, because this I already know is like good, but we're going to base it solely on the first paragraph. So this is about a depraved woman named Joan. After she witnesses a shocking act of violence, she decides to flee New York City in search of this woman named Alice. Alice apparently is the only one who can help her make sense of her past. So she goes to Los Angeles and unravels the horrific event that happened in her past. That's pretty much all I need to know to be intrigued. So chapter one, I drove myself out of New York City where a man shot himself in front of me. He was a gluttonous man, and when his blood came out, it looked like the blood of a pig. That's a cruel thing to think, I know. He did it in a restaurant where I was having dinner with another man, another married man. Do you see how this is going? But I wasn't always that way. Dang it, that is how you write a first freaking paragraph. That's good, that's going in yes. Yep. Okay, next is a short story collection by Brian Evenson called The Glassy Burning Floor of Hell. Another one I've been wanting to read for freaking months, but I just haven't gotten around to it. I kind of always dread short story collections because I historically don't really like them, but Brian Evenson is supposed to be a really good spooky writer. So these are supposed to be really good short stories. So I'm just gonna read the first paragraph. Oh, should we, should we be really chaotic? Maybe let's read the first paragraph of a random story. Do we do that? Okay, so I opened to the story, His Haunting. So let's read the first paragraph of that. Three times in his life, someone or something unknown had opened Arn's door as he tried to sleep, silently sliding it ajar and then standing immobile in the gap. That was all, just standing there, unmoving, just barely visible in the darkness. It wasn't even all that threatening, he told his therapist, not really. What had disturbed him most about it was not knowing who or what it was. In the darkness, he could make nothing out beyond the door's frame and the silhouette of the figure enclosed within. A large figure, male almost certainly, 
hulking, head nearly scraping the lintel. I don't know what a lintel is, but that was still a really good first paragraph. And especially for it to be like a random story in the middle and not just like the first one. Cause I think if I was gonna write a short story collection, I would obviously put my most, like one of my most banging stories in the front to convince people to buy it. And then like maybe the ones in the middle are kind of like, you know, they're mid, but that sounds pretty good. So I'm gonna put this in yes. I wanna put this in yes. Okay, next, another one that I've been wanting to read for so long and I just haven't gotten around to it. And then I woke up by Malcolm Devlin. This is about a post-apocalyptic scenario wherein the plague affects your ability to perceive reality. I love any book that has themes of distorted perceptions of reality because that's super spooky to me personally. And I think that's really unique. Okay, so I'm gonna read you the first paragraph. Whenever I tell people what happened, I tell them it was a love story. I stand by that, even though I know when I'm done, you might disagree. Dang, so okay, that's like short. That's pretty short first paragraph, but that sounds really good. I'm putting that in yes. That's going in yes. Next is You've Lost a Lot of Blood by Eric Laraca. Eric Laraca is a pretty good author. Even the ones where I'm like, oh, that wasn't like a total hit for me. It's still like, that was weird and memorable and I appreciate that. There really isn't a synopsis for this. I just know it's gonna be spooky. There's like centipedes inside. So that's kind of all I need to know. Okay, so this says, Relics from the Night We Both perished, May 17th, 2019. Each precious thing I've ever shown him is a holy relic from the night we both perished. The night when I combed him from my hair and watered the moon with his blood. An ivory fang stapled against a black curtain like the x-ray of a child's broken bone. A glorious thing to be worshipped, or to at least be acknowledged as, quote, vessel of sorrow, quote, creator of tides, quote, pitcher of divine light. He was nothing more than milkweed to be plucked, a discarded plant to be uprooted and torn by the stem until it lies there quivering in your hand, shaking, trembling, frightened. That sounds pretty good. I'm gonna put that in yes. Next is Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit. This is one I wanna read in April, regardless of if I read it on my trip, because I wanna read this for the Trans Girl April readathon. So this is, I think, a haunted house story. These friends go into this haunted house when they were like younger, something happens. And now three years later, they decide that they need to go back and confront what happened there in order to move on with their lives. So sounds good to me. First paragraph, prologue, the face in the wall. Long after after the house is gone, it's there. The boy and his parents moved into the new flat around a year ago. It was a new flat, but it didn't feel new. It was damp and cold, and it had felt hostile to them the moment they hauled their stuff inside. The boy's mother knew in that moment that they had made a terrible mistake, but by that point, it was too late. They lived here. They could not afford to live somewhere else. Yep, that's such a classic horror trope. Young family purchases a haunted house, unknowingly gets there. Oh no, it's haunted, but we put all of our money into this and we can't leave. Which I will say, I don't think that's my favorite trope, but I don't hate it. I'm gonna put this in maybe. Let's go on a maybe. Next is Do You Dream of Terra 2 by Temi O. Oh. This is speculative fiction where a century ago, an astronomer discovered an Earth-like planet kind of nearby. Today, 10 astronauts are going on a voyage to settle that Earth-like planet. It'll take the team 23 years to reach Terra 2, 23 years locked in closed quarters, 23 years with no one to rely on but one another, 23 years with no rescue possible should something go wrong, and something always goes wrong. So yeah, that sounds good. Okay, first paragraph. It is just like Earth, Terra 2. It has turned in silence for millennia on the same spiraled arm of the galaxy. It is enveloped in temperate air, oxygen, nitrogen, noble gases, dark oceans licking empty shores. It's luxuriant with life. Trees burst from the dirt. Electric blue fish slalom? What verb is that? Did she make up a verb? I've never seen that word in my life. Electric blue fish slalom through coral reefs and the wind is heavy with moss spores that germinate in shadows. Wild, everything, the land and the flowers. That sounds pretty good. I'm a little intimidated by the length because I'm only going on my trip for a week. So it's like, am I really gonna read this whole thing in a week? I don't know, I'm gonna put it in yes anyway because I write my own rules. Okay, next one. This is the second to last. Out by Natsuo Carino. Another one that I've been wanting to read for months. Are you sensing a theme with the books that I've chosen? I've really been wanting to knock more off my physical TBR and I'm like so sure I'm gonna like this. So imagine a suburban Tokyo mom and she 
she has it with her husband. So she kills him. She kills her abusive husband and then asks her co-workers to help her dispose of the body. So we love to see women supporting women in all their deeds. Okay, one thing I will say. Look at the text on this. It's like, oh my god, this is like a textbook. I think that's part of why I've been so hesitant to pick this up. Okay, chapter one, night shift. She got to the parking lot earlier than usual. The thick, damp July darkness engulfed her as she stepped out of the car. Perhaps it was the heat and humidity, but the night seemed especially black and heavy. Feeling a bit short of breath, Masako Katori looked up at the starless night sky. Her skin, which had been cool and dry in the air-conditioned car, began to feel sticky. Mixed in with the exhaust fumes from the Shin Ume Expressway, she could smell the faint odor of deep-fried food. The odor of the boxed lunch factory where she was going to work. I don't like that they used odor twice in the same sentence. Uh, so that's going to no. know. Okay, last one is Lullabies for Little Criminals by Patrick. Nope, what? I made up a name. That is nowhere near Patrick. Heather O'Neill by Heather O'Neill. This is about a young girl named Baby who is 13 years old. She's being raised by her father who is, he's kind of a deadbeat dad. I think it's basically like Baby trying to survive and grow up on Skid Row. So that sounds pretty cool. So the first paragraph is chapter one, Life with Jules. Right before my 12th birthday, my dad Jules and I moved into a two room apartment in a building that we called the Ostrich Hotel. It was the first time I could remember taking a taxi cab anywhere. It led us off in the alley behind the building where all the walls had pretty graffiti painted on them. There was a cartoon cow with a sad look on his face and a girl with an oxygen mask holding a tiny baby in her arms. I don't know. Should this go in maybe? I think this will go in maybe. Okay, I'm going for a week. I'm already reading two books. So maybe I'll pick three more books. This is my yes pile. Duty Room of Terror 2, You've Lost a Lot of Blood and Then I Woke Up, Glassy Burning Floor of Hell, Animal in the Pisces. I think I'm gonna get rid of Duty Room of Terror 2 because I just know I'm going to be less apt to pick it up because of its length while I'm on vacation. Okay, which of these had the best first paragraph? I think the Pisces. This kind of has like vacation vibes to me, so I'm going to take the Pisces for sure. And then my maybe pile. Okay, okay, so this is my maybe pile. Hurricane season, tell me I'm worthless, lullabies for little criminals. These two I think I'm going to take out because I don't even really remember their first paragraph. It wasn't that good. But I just really freaking want to read this, so maybe I should just take this. Hurricane season. I'm taking. And then what about these? My heart is telling me... Uh, I want to take the Brian Evenson one. I'll take a short story collection. And then maybe, and then I woke up. Yeah, I feel good about that. Okay, this is the stack. I like the look of this because they're all like a couple hundred pages. Feels very doable and like more compact so I can take them on the plane. I feel good. So we have And Then I Woke Up by Malcolm Devlin, The Pisces by Melissa Broder, Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchor, and The Glassy Burning Floor of Hell by Brian Evenson. Cool, this was fun. This was exciting. So I hope that you were able to get some samples of some books that you might like. I will let you know how I like these ones. I'm going to Seattle now, so I need to go make my flight. But thank you so much for being here. Like this video if you want, comment, subscribe if you want. I would love to have you. And I appreciate you so much. I love you so much. I'll go bye.